Hello and welcome to English Rumi, the channel that mostly explores the wisdom and beauty of this 13th century Iranian poet and mystic Jalal al-Din Rumi. In this video, we will focus on Rumi's controversial and perhaps contrary views on Hussein, the grandson of Prophet Muhammad, who was killed in the Battle of Karbala in 680 CE, but also how he commented on the extreme mourning performed annually by Shias over his killing in the incident of Karbala. Before diving into any discussion, let's briefly discuss the events that lead to massacre of Karbala. The event of Karbala was triggered by Yazid's demand for allegiance from Hussein after he became the caliph in 680 CE. However, Hussein refused to pledge allegiance to Yazid because he considered him an illegitimate and immoral ruler. He also received many letters and messages from the people of Kufa, a city in Iraq that was a stronghold of Shiism and a center of opposition to Yazid's rule. They invited him to come to Kufa and lead them in a revolt against Yazid. Hussein decided to accept their invitation and left Mecca with his family and companions in September 680 CE. He hoped to reach Kufa peacefully and reform the Muslim community. However, he faced many obstacles and difficulties on his way as his plans were discovered by Yazid's forces and intercepted by Yazid's army near Karbala where he was surrounded by thousands of soldiers. Meanwhile, he was betrayed by some of his supporters in Kufa who switched sides or remained silent when Yazid's forces arrived. Hussein and his few supporters were all eventually killed by Yazid's soldiers. The most controversial Rumi's verse in directly pointing to Karbala incident is this one. Heed, don't run rashly in the plain of pain. Heed, don't blindly march to Karbala's bane. This verse is part of a longer passage where Rumi talks about the lessons learned by the Quranic story of two angels, Harut and Marut. This passage may reflect Rumi's opinion about Karbala incident, at least when he was writing his third book of Masnavi Manem. Harut and Marut were sent by God to test the people of Babylon with their knowledge of magic. They were given the choice to either remain in heaven or descend to earth and face the temptations of the world. They chose the latter, thinking that they could resist any trial and teach people good deeds. However, they soon fell into the trap of their own arrogance and lost. They were seduced by a woman who was actually a demon in disguise. She made them worship an idol and commit adultery with her in exchange for teaching her magic. As soon as they did that, they lost their angelic status and became imprisoned in a well where they remained until the day of judgment. The lesson of this story is that one should not be overconfident or reckless in one's decisions, but rather be cautious and prudent in one's actions. One should also seek God's guidance and protection in every situation and not be deceived by one's ego or by the devil. Since Rumi is using the Karbala incident to moreover elaborate on the lessons learned by Harut and Marut, we can conclude that Rumi thinks Hussein perhaps fell in the same trap as he also chose to start a journey without thinking through everything. He also thought that he could resist any temptation and teach people good deeds. He was tempted by the prospect of gaining power and taking caliphate back to his lineage with the help of Kufis, and he did not examine and study the geopolitical situation of the era carefully. However, he soon faced the consequences of his own ignorance in trusting people of Kufa who had priorly betrayed his father Ali and his brother Hassan. He was betrayed by some of his supporters who were actually demons in disguise. In contrast to what we just analyzed, Rumi also showed some indirect admiration and praise for Hussein's tragic journey in the sixth book of Masnavi through the eyes of a tourist who is traveling to the city of Halab in Syria. As soon as he arrives, he witnesses some people who are bitterly lamenting and weeping over the demise of someone. The tourist is curious and asks a local man about the reason and the origin of this ritual. The local man explains that this is a Shia tradition that commemorates the martyrdom of Hussein, the grandson of Prophet Muhammad. He explains Shiites mourn for Hussein every year on the day of Ashura or the 10th day of Muharram, which is the anniversary of his death. The tourist listens to the local man's account and tries to empathize with his perspective. He respects his faith and his devotion. 
but he also wonders about his logic and his emotion. He wonders why he's so attached to a historical figure and so angry at other ones like Yazid, who all died more than a thousand years ago. He wonders if this ritual has any benefits or purpose for him or for anyone else. He also suggests that their death was a cause for celebration rather than sorrow because they were freed from the prison of this world and attained the eternal kingdom of God. His majestic soul took flight from the prison, tearing clothes and biting hands. For what reason? Since he was the king of faith and miracles, it's time to rejoice as he broke his shackles. He sped toward the pinnacle of might. He cast away his bonds and chains of blight. It is the day of joy, glory and delight if you have a trace of wisdom from his light. In fact, here Rumi subtly challenges the Shiite tradition of mourning Hussein's death by stating that if you really believe Hussein was a figure of morality, bravery, and martyrdom, then you must celebrate his spiritual flight to eternity. He believed that true love for Hussein should lead to emulation of his virtues rather than imitation of his sufferings. To understand Rumi's view on the Karbala incident more deeply, we need to take a snapshot of history again. According to various historical books, especially the most credible one, History of Tabari, Hussein tried to negotiate with Yazid's commander Omar ibn Sa'd after his caravan was surrounded by Yazid's forces. He asked him to give him one of these three options to let him go back to Medina, to let him go to a borderland where he could serve Islam, or to let him go to Yazid's court and talk to him directly. However, Omar ibn Sa'd refused to grant him any of these options because he was ordered by Yazid's governor in Kufa, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, to bring Hussein to him as a captive and finally, if he resisted, to kill him. Hussein also refused to surrender to Ubaid ibn Ziyad whom he considered a tyrant and a bastard since his father was not really known. Hussein indeed was seen surrendering to a baseborn like Obeid as a sign of detraction or lessening of his reputation. In fact, this kind of low look on people with no clear parental roots is reflected in Quran too, as we discussed before in the end of this clip. So what we realize from the historical facts is that Hussein was not constantly pursuing any sort of heroic or suicidal act by fighting a whole army of 10,000 soldiers with only a few of his men in Karbala. In fact, like a wise person, he was looking for a way out of the catastrophe. The Shiite mourning tradition nowadays involves various rituals such as fasting, reciting elegies, beating chests, shedding tears, and even drawing blood from the first day of Muharram all the way to the 10th day of Muharram and it continues for another 40 days until the calendar reaches the day of Arba'in. Amazingly, if you live in a Shiite dominated country like Iran and you celebrate your own birthday party sometime in the middle of these days, you may face harsh and violent reactions by Shiites. No! And more amazingly is that Shiite clerics insist that Hussein deliberately sought to confront Yazid because Yazid was an immoral royal who used to drink wine, pet dogs and monkeys and also actively participate in musical festivities where women and girls also danced. You may think that sounds so much like a normal 21st century civilian, but you have to keep in mind that in Islamic laws, drinking, dancing, singing, and music is either stigmatized or forbidden, especially for women. Thus, Shia clerics believe that Hussein was attempting to reestablish those Islamic laws that Yazid and his father Muawiyah let loose in their era. And while they persistently convict Yazid of his forces brutality, the Shia scholars overlook the fact that Hussein was involved in the massacre of suppressing the people of Tabaristan in north of Iran in 657 CE. According to many historical sources, such as History of Tabari, Yazid, on the other hand, was a poet as well who composed about 100 verses, most of which reflect his liberal ideas. His poetic output was modest compared to other poets, but his influence was far reaching. 
Many poets in the Middle East were inspired by his style and themes. For example, Hafez, one of the greatest Iranian poets, began his poetry book with a couplet from Yazid. Moreover, his poetry style and context bear a striking resemblance to Khayyam in terms of using wine, music, and girls to reflect his liberal views on life and religion. Khayyam is another great Persian poet whose poetry we discussed before in this series. Wait with me till the end of the clip, as I'll end this clip with one of Yazid's artistic poems. Therefore, if we want to put the clash between Yazid and Hussein in today's world context, we can say that their fight was a battle between liberal versus Islamism or secularism against theocracy. Considering all these facts, Rumi did not approve of these Shia practices because he thought they were contrary to the spirit of Islam and Sufism. He also believed that true mourning for Hussein should be done in the heart rather than on the body, and what Rumi is against is the process of canonization in which people elevate a human being to the level of the deity. Rumi did not idolize or idealize Hussein, but rather respected and appreciated him for his virtues and values. Rumi did not seek to imitate or emulate Hussein's sufferings, but rather to learn from his teachings and experiences. Rumi's view on the Karbala incident was not based on sectarian or emotional biases, but rather on rational and spiritual insights. Before I read you Yazid's poem, I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new about Rumi and Hussein. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more videos on mystical poetry and wisdom. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Arise, you who grieve in sorrow, and listen to the music's flow. Drink a goblet of wine. Leave your regrets behind. The lute song drew me away from hearing the call to pray. I'd rather have a vintage than a far hoary image.